Okay, so let's get on to our um, faulty washer type of incontinence. Still used, it's been used for years, are clamps called the Cunningham clamp. And this is what it looks like. And there's a website that you can go on. Forget the name of it. You just look up Cunningham clamp. There's a place in Alberta that makes these things. And what it is, it's a sponge clamp that opens like this and you clamp it and close it around your penis. It's like tying a rope around your penis. And what you do is you wear this until you get the urge to pee and then you undo the clamp and you pee. You can't put it, leave it on at night because it may erode your penis. And the problems are, of course, it's easy to use and it does work. However, it's very bulky because you go to the beach, you can see it sticking out of your bathing suit. Uh, and it can cause necrosis or pressure necrosis, death of penile skin if you leave it on too long, etc., or if it doesn't fit properly. And it's a nice temporary thing, but it's not really like the type of thing that people want to walk around and wear this clamp on their penis for the rest of their life when they're all alternatives. A catheter is always an option. There's two types of catheters. The commonest type of thing we see is the regular Foley catheter, which people here that have had the surgery done, you had that in following the surgery. Well, it can be worn permanently. You don't leak, but you got to wear a bag your urine smells, and you always have bacteria in your urine. There's an external catheter called a condom catheter, which is like a condom that you have for sex, but it's got a hole on the end. So you wear it over your penis, and this end gets attached to a little tube, and it gets attached to a bag so you can pee into or leak into this condom catheter, but you still have to wear a bag and it has the same complications as the clamp where it can cause erosion of the penile skin if it's applied too tightly or left on for too long. So it exists, but once again, not the best thing. So we talked about fluid. So even if you have the faulty washer, if you decrease your fluid intake and void more frequently, um, you might notice a bit better incontinence. Caffeine and alcohol are bladder irritants, and so if you have this leaky washer, but you do something to make your bladder contract sooner than it might like, you'll have more leakage. And of course, if you are leaking and have nothing else done, avoid activities that cause you to leak. Don't go to the gym. Don't carry the groceries home from the store, etc., like that, so you do behavioral modification. So this is a little thing about fluids, man. A lot of people don't know this. There's bladder-friendly fluids and fluids to avoid. Avoid caffeinated products. So that's coffee. That's a lot of the pop that we have, unless it's decaffeinated. Limit alcohol and all citrus juices are bladder irritants. Orange juice, grapefruit juice, they all are. Water, and these are if taken in modification, is not, a, is not an irritant. It's bladder-friendly. Cranberry juice, apple juice, and grape juice are all bladder friendly. The only way you pee a lot is if you drink a lot, but they do not irritate your bladder at all and increase your chances of leakage. They have, we have these things called pelvic floor rehabilitation where you get hooked up in a lab and try to stimulate your pelvic floor muscles. Not available everywhere. It's supposed to will say to do this instead of actual manual Kegel exercises, but the data would suggest that these fancy machines in these physio labs uh, probably isn't a lot better than the verbal instruction I told you about how to do Kegel exercises on your own properly. Now, you've got a leaky washer, so Intuition, and we've used a clamp to do it, tells us that if your sphincter or your control muscle is deficient, can hold the urine back. If we somehow block the flow of urine, and we've talked about clamps already, you might be better. Well, things have been tried. Collagen is the thing that has been tried. Carbon beads, fat, 
the success rate for collagen, which is a connective tissue derivative injected around the control muscle, which bulks up the tissue where the defect is to try and create an obstruction, the success rate's less than 20%, and it must be repeated. Um, and there are allergic reactions, reactions. Some studies with collagen have suggested that incontinence eventually might get worse because you are replacing whatever control muscle you have left and replacing it with connective tissue and it has a reaction so incontinence is often worse after collagen injections and it's very expensive and I've mentioned the repeat treatments. So now let's get on to the patient who still leaks you don't want a clamp, you don't want a catheter, collagen is no good, so what can we do to make you dry? We've got two excellent surgical options which are now available with long track records of success. The Cadillac, or we nowadays, we used to say Cadillac, now it's the BMW or the Lexus, whatever, for the treatment of incontinence, and we're going to talk about that last, is the artificial urinary sphincter. For years and years and years, various types of slings have been used for women with this type of stress incontinence. And initially in men, there were types of sling procedures which acted to increase the resistance to urine flow, act as an obstruction like a clamp, but from the outside to lead to better urinary control. However, now about five or six years ago in Austria, they came out with this thing called the Advanced Urinary Male Sling. When we're going to talk about incontinence, for patients with post-prostatectomy issues, we can talk about mild, moderate, and severe incontinence. What does that mean? Well, if you're really sophisticated, we look at pad weight. How much does each pad weigh? Well, if you want to look at it in a sort of a cruder sense, it's how many pads a day do you wear? One, two, three, four, five, six. So basically speaking, anything five pads or less per day is considered mild or moderate, anything above that is considered severe incontinence. And if we want to be as black and white as possible, we can probably say, and I'll show you how this sling works and in what's involved, for anybody with mild or moderate incontinence, we can pretty well restore almost full continence to them by using this sling. And for people who have severe incontinence, or who fail the sling, they then will have the artificial sphincter put in. And I'm going to show you. This is the sling I'm holding up. Now, the sling is an outpatient procedure. In and out, same day. Done through a small incision underneath your scrotum. And then you end up with two little holes here which heal up in no time at all. Now, the difference between this sling and all the other treatments I've talked about is this doesn't create a blockage or obstruction. From the point of view of anatomy, yes, we're talking about um, control muscle problems, and if we're anticipating putting a sling in a patient, the first thing I want to know as the surgeon is do you have control muscle left? Because this sling, as we'll show you, enhances the function of your control muscle. And I'll tell you how that does it in a second. So what we'll do with all of you is we take you to our procedure room. We'll put a flexible cystoscope in. We'll have a look and we'll have you squeeze. Do a Kegel maneuver. And if I see your sphincter contract enough, I can probably tell you this is the operation for you. 
So you've got a faulty control muscle, but when we take out your whole prostate and leave the control muscle at the very bottom end, we have things change. Instead of things coming straight out like this through the sphincter area in the prostate, they drop. So there's an angle there. And it's been shown if we can restore, get rid of this angle and pull things up, we can improve continence without causing obstruction. And that's what this sling does. It restores the inside part of your urine passage to its proper anatomical po position, which optimizes the remaining control muscle that you have and it restores urinary control. And this is what it looks like. This little thing here, this got six sides to it, is what goes around your urine passage and this is sewn into the tissue around the urine passage and then these two ends are then pulled up through two little holes just outside your pelvis and it is tightened and what we see when we do the surgery is we're looking this way we see your urine passage go whoop. and once I see when I pull this up your urine passage goes there I pull this out and then these stay in place this plastic comes off of course uh, and your sphincter function has been restored your continence if the sling is going to work, will be there from day one. You'll go home and you'll be dry. And in fact, there are some patients who even are put into urinary retention following this sling, which gets better as things relax. So continence is immediately restored. And this is for mild to moderate incontinence with a simple 45 to 60 minute outpatient procedure. No reason <laughs> to even wear one or two pads a day if it bothers you, because this will fix you. And that's what it looks like, uh, what I've shown you there, this little thing that gets sewn in. So the good candidates are, as we say, one to five pads per day. With mild to moderate, that's what we call. And you've got to have that residual sphincter function that we can demonstrate when we look at your bladder or your urine passage with the scope. It's got to be there. And then we can say, well, here's your candidate for that. If you have recurring urinary tract infections, obviously blood coagulation issues, etc., something that might lead to, we'll say, infection of the sling uh, and uh, upper tract or, or kidney problems, but that's very rare. Most patients that have post-prostatectomy incontinence, mild to moderate, are candidates for the sling. And this is old data. It's probably better. 94% of patients that have had this operation use less than one pad per day. Three quarters are completely dry. 100% of patients are satisfied and very little urinary retention reported.